These are some training clinical psychologists on my course at Oxford University. This video is about how we passed our interviews to get here. If you're new to my channel, my name's Francis. I'm a training clinical psychologist studying at Oxford University. I applied to the doctorate once in 2022. I managed to get two interviews and then one offer. So I thought it'd be helpful to share my own interview preparation process. But I also thought to ask some people on my course about their interviews because we all come from very different backgrounds and we have different interview experiences. So trainees in this video have interviewed at Oxford, Sheffield, UCL, Kings and Exeter. So we have some course specific advice, but mainly we have a lot of general advice, which can be applied to psychology interviews in general and also interviews in general, actually. Hopefully you find this video helpful. If you're watching this video because you have an interview, congratulations, it is a huge achievement. Firstly, what was my general approach? Obviously we can't share the exact questions we were asked, but realistically, there are three types of questions, clinical questions, research questions, and questions about professional issues. So let's address each of these in turn after saying hello to each of the other trainees in this video. Hello. Hello there. I'm Hazard Gavin. Hey, how are you? Francis, I'm so sorry. I know that you just called, but my laptop is about to die and I don't think I have time to do this anymore. Well, I'm I, have, on. I have like cooler things to do, much, much better things to do, better uses of my time than sitting here and talking to you. Oh, you're the guy who bribed his way onto the course? I mean, first I said yes, because I pitied you. And now I'm just like regretting that because it's my Sunday and I don't need to spend it seeing your face. <laughs> I'm Sean. I applied last year to Nottingham, Leicester, Bath and Oxford. I got one interview for Oxford and got through. I'm Alexandra and I had interviews last year with UCL, Oxford and Royal Holloway, but I didn't go through with the Royal Holloway interview. Ah, uh, because you'd already got uh, an offer. Yeah. Lovely stuff. I'm Roisin. I had interviews at Oxford and Exeter. I'm Liam. I have previously interviewed at Oxford and uh, the IOPPN. Lovely. Show us your jumper. Look at that. Guess my choice. I think from listening to other trainees talk about their interview processes, I realize how different people's advice is. And sometimes one person's advice would directly contradict another's. And uh, that's okay. I think it shows how there isn't a one size fits all approach to preparing for interviews or one ideal way to getting into a clinical psychology course. But it's about taking what you find especially relevant and helpful to you while watching this video. Basically, my preparation involved making a massive Word document about these three areas, clinical research and professional issues. But beyond preparing factual information for the interview, I also gave some thought to interview technique and managing nerves, which I will come on to towards the end of the video. I'd thought about some of the clients I'd worked with previously, thought about the formulations, reflectors, and some of those cases. Um, and in doing so, I really try to push my reflections quite far. I don't think that I put it in that clear of a fl framework. I practiced a lot in my head with friends. We just FaceTimed a lot and just threw questions at each other back and forth. So let's start with clinical. My approach to preparing for potential clinical questions was just like a lot of people to prepare three cases that I'd worked with. For me, one was about an intervention I gave and the other two were just assessments because I was working in an assessment service last year at the time while I was studying at UCL. Day in the Life vlogs on my channel, if you're interested in watching those. I made sure the cases were quite different. So one of them went really well, uh, one was okay, and then another just straight up went terribly. I took different reflections from each of them. I kind of prepared like three different case studies and just had those as things that I could kind of take a lot of boxes with. So supervision or things that didn't work out or different models I'd used. I wasn't as organized as thinking of, okay, one good case, one bad case. I had a couple of cases prepared that I knew I could talk about in whatever angle I was approached with like a formulation question. Mm. Another one would be uh, like uh, give an example of when you used supervision and then I would bring in one of one of the cases that I found particularly difficult and explain how I used supervision to navigate that. Was there a, a case you think that made you grow a lot as a professional or that affected you? Thinking about how to present these cases, I use the STAR framework. You'll find the STAR framework in most generic careers advice. It stands for situation. In this case, talking about the client's presentation, the service you were working in, task. So what was your actual job with the client? Was it just to formulate and explore difficulties? Or was it to try and enact some change through delivering an intervention? Action. So what did I actually do to carry out that task? What specific skills did I use? And and what theories were those skills based on? Results, so what was the actual outcome? Which could be both a subjective feeling and also objective measures, like outcome measures that specify levels of anxiety and depression, for example. And then lastly, and most importantly by far, is the second R in STAR, which is reflection. 
And this is probably more unique to clinical psychology. Did you structure your sort of clinical preparation, situation, task, action, result? And then another after reflection. It's a bit keen really, isn't it? I mean, I'm very keen normally, but it just didn't like, it didn't work for me. I think also because I tried to apply these different cases that I was very much like, I can use it for this, this or this. So I was kind of ready to adapt it and focus in more on different parts of it, if that makes sense. So I didn't really have a clean framework. I just had my ramblings about what had happened before, basically. I was told by, by my mentor that I should be using something a bit more structured even when i'm when i typed up my application but i think mm. for me if i had to hold something like that in mind on the spot while being interviewed i i think that would have muddled me up more than just trying to relax and talk through it the mm. way with anyway i largely started with um sort of formulation spoke a bit about how that informed the rationale of the intervention i did um then discussed the intervention and then dedicated more time to trying to integrate reflections into my responses to the interview questions. When you provide formulations, I was just wondering what that was like. What kinds of models did you use? I knew that the courses that I was applying to were very CBT heavy. So I formulated all of my clients uh, using CBT models. Thought a bit about systemic stuff, but um, to be honest, I, I hadn't really read much about systemic before mm -hmm. Oxford course. So um, I just kind of used the bits and pieces that I picked up along the way. But I thought a little bit about some other models I come across as well, like compassion focused therapy, a bit of CAT as well, so cognitive analytic therapy, different ideas within those different frameworks um, that I was that I was coming from with uh, sort of two or three clients. So did you do like dedicated reading around sort of new um, schools of therapy? to prepare for the interview. I brushed up on CBT because I'd come across that quite a few times and the work that I'd done as an assistant psychologist. Kings and Oxford, um, they both have systemic courses. So I was quite eager to make sure that I had some knowledge of, of what that entailed. I tried to refrain from reading about um, new schools of therapy. I could best spend my time in other places, such as thinking about clients. Uh, formulating them more deeply using the same models. Yeah, the staff, staff framework, not that popular apparently, but uh, I'll try not to take that personally. Reflecting, I think, is quite a difficult process to pin down. You can use a framework like the Rolf model, which asks what, so what, and now what, or you could use the Kolb experiential learning cycle. But to be honest, a lot of my reflections just kind of came to me and it made me ponder what is a good reflection. Liam has a good explanation of this, which I will show shortly. But here are some example reflections that I personally came up with and you can decide whether these were any good. I firstly reflected on the importance of applying evidence-based approaches, but in a manner that comes across as organic and intuitive. I think in a lot of cases, just going through the motions of rolling out a therapy manual can feel a bit dehumanizing and hamper the ability to establish rapport with a client, which is ultimately the foundation of your entire treatment, especially for clients who have a lot of professionals in their lives and not just you. It can be difficult to get started on an intervention when rightfully so there can be a lot of doubt and mistrust of professionals in general, uh, or maybe just the sense that they don't really take an interest in your life. So I found that quite important to prioritize. Another reflection I had was about hope working in the NHS, especially if people find treatment really helpful and get on well, they likely won't come back and you won't see them again. But otherwise, for many very valid reasons, if a client doesn't get on well after an intervention, uh, life circumstances might change, for example, they might come back to a service and a lot of the clients that engage with psychological services are ones that have had previous encounters with services and that's completely normal. But I guess it leaves you with quite a skewed evidence base in your mind of how successful psychological interventions can be. And I think that's impacted my ability at times to hold hope for clients, but equally it can impact a client's ability to hold hope for themselves. Because if they're finding themselves back at a service or in therapy, it can feel like on some level that's a failure, even though it's not. And that's quite a depressing picture, but I think it made me reflect on the importance of asking about strengths and positives in sessions because there can be quite a negative focus in therapy of like what is wrong but giving some space to discuss the positives and what strengths a client already has what's already working for them can be a benefit to both the clinician and the client what constitutes in <laughs> nice mug uh what constitutes <laughs> in that reflection a, a very superficial reflection for example might be something like um thinking about how a particular demographic trait that either you or the client has 
influences the therapeutic work. Thinking about how that influences the therapeutic work in terms of its effect on you is perhaps pushing that a bit further. And then thinking about how you might react to the way that they're acting and then right. so that might have and so on, following down that kind of cycle of patterns. And then also thinking perhaps more across time with your reflections. So one of the things that I try and think about with clients quite a lot is that if um, something that um, I'm perceiving that they are doing, if that is bringing up a particular reaction in me, I can sometimes think about, well, what is the likely implication if that reaction was brought up in other clinicians as well? And then you can think about how that might have perpetuated cycles across services and the way that services have reacted to clients and the kind of views that they might then have and on services. So that kind of thing, I think, was pushing reflections a bit further than um, simply thinking about a trait such as I am a man that will influence therapy. Moving on to research, I prepared a few things for potential research questions. Firstly, just summarising research projects I'd done and been involved with at undergrad and masters. Then I thought about how I might design a research project from scratch. And finally, I found an interesting research paper in case I was asked to talk about one. And this particularly was a challenge because I don't know about you, but after a long day of work, uh, I don't tend to read academic papers. So I'll speak a bit more about how I found a paper in the next section on professional issues. When preparing for all these questions, I followed a broadly similar structure. Uh, I think it's important to balance explaining everything in as simple terms as possible. Often there's a service user representative on the panel, but I was also mindful of showing an understanding of more technical aspects of research because you are applying for a postgraduate course with a research project. So this is the structure I followed when preparing to talk about research. Firstly, I had a punchy opener, a headline, making it clear why you should be interested in this study. Second, I talked about background and rationale, underlying theories involved in the particular study, what the gap in the literature was to be addressed, or in the case of designing a study, I just said I would conduct a literature review in order to identify those gaps. Hypotheses, so what are the aims and objectives of the study? What would the null hypothesis be and then the alternative hypothesis? Sample and recruitment, what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria? How is recruitment done? Would it be through an external collaboration with uh, a different organisation? Would you use clinics, undergraduate students, support groups, the internet? So what's an adequate sample size to carry out the chosen analysis, which I'll come on to shortly? And what practicalities had to be considered or would you have to consider, whether that's time, money, facilities, and so on? Methodology, so did the study compare two groups? Did it look at correlations between two or more variables? Was it longitudinal or cross-sectional? Did it use questionnaires? Did it have an experimental design? Did it involve participant observation? physiological measures, interviews, focus groups, RCTs. These are some words I came across in my reading and just kind of held in mind. Uh, and then a really important section I think is ethics and specifically data protection. How did a study make sure a participant's data was safe? How would you ensure uh, data in your study was safe? How would it comply with GDPR? Also, how would you address other ethical issues that might arise during a study, which which psychological studies have tons of ethical issues. And then the bane of my existence, statistical analysis. So thinking about if a study used a t-test and an over a regression analysis, oh, it's, it's actually disgusting. When I was preparing for interview, I found this chart online, a quite a nice flow chart actually, in terms of thinking about if I had to design a study, what statistical test would I use? But looking back, I didn't need to memorize this for the interview. I think it was probably quite overkill. And as you'll hear from other trainees, I don't think you need to worry too much about knowing all the stats methods in and out. And I talk about results, uh, obviously not for a study I'm planning to design, but the results of studies I might have talked about. What are the interpretations of the data and what were the conclusions? Following on from this, what is the impact of a given paper? What could the paper add to society? beyond adding to academic literature? What are the clinical implications and how can it support and change existing policies? And finally, the most important section of talking about research, I believe, is limitations and potential improvements that could be made. There are a few frameworks to critique research, for example, Prisma, CASP and KMET. There's loads more, but yeah, reflecting on limitations of research, I think goes a long way. Here's what the other trainees thought about research. For the research side of stuff, um, I didn't do loads to prepare for that. I own situation at the time I was doing a master's, so I was quite involved with research anyway. So I was kind of up to date with what I was doing, but I did look over my old 
um, stuff that I'd worked on previously from undergrad, I very much followed the structure of a paper. So I gave like a brief outline of the kind of relevant theory that you were testing, spoke a bit through the methods in terms of sample design, that kind of thing, mentioned the results and then tied it back to theory, what is the important thing. But I think with research questions, one of the things that um, people forget is that you can really reflect in those questions as well. Um, and even if a question doesn't explicitly call you to reflect, for example, if a question says something like, tell me about a piece of research you've done, I think it's still very helpful to reflect on that. Prior to doing work as an assistant psychologist, I think my research was very heavily theoretical. The clinical implications of my research weren't something that was really a concern for me. But after working as an assistant psychologist, I found that I really had a sort of increase in my passion for making sure the research has clinical relevance. That doesn't mean it's all intervention focused, but tying it to men's health difficulties. I thought about a book that I read recently that has to do the field of uh, psychology thought about as well uh, a recent article that I read that I found interesting I tried to critically review it in case I got asked a research question like you know tell us about an article and what you think about it how did you structure those kinds of answers every time I tried to do that when I was doing a mock interview I got way too caught up in trying to structure it that way rather than allowing myself to be myself was that your main takeaway from mock interviews like, yeah to sort of, yeah come across as yourself more yeah like less robotic and stiff i had sort of two papers that i knew quite well um just that i could talk about they were intervention based papers and and the logic behind that was in case i got asked about you know discuss a recent paper or something like that then i wanted to make sure that i had one or two up my sleeve so i had a really shit paper and a good paper i convinced myself i had to know all the stat tests having never been able to remember them in my life i was suddenly like right i need to sit and look at this table that tells me which stat yeah. tests are using which and they're going to quiz me on it they obviously weren't but i felt like i needed to um you and still didn't to. remember them in the interview but yeah i focused way too much on the stats because i was scared they were going to ask about them i prepped a research paper as in like read one and prepared to be able to like talk it through and things like that yeah i think i read a like opinion piece as well just in case they asked more about something i'd read or something mm. that affect my clinical practice i think and then prep my own research paper and again Exeter was really helpful and like they prompted me during the interview to say a bit more about what I'd done and really like I went in feeling like I couldn't brag too much like they might think I was bragging but it's actually fine like as an interview you're meant to mm. say the good things that you did so tough yeah general processes in um, designing research and mm. also an awareness of the common pitfalls in research I think is probably um, a really helpful thing to have to hand it doesn't have to be the world's greatest design, for example, if they ask you to design a study in session, in the interview. As long as you've got an awareness of the kind of stuff that you covered at undergrad, that would be more than enough. Having an awareness of other fields of psychology that really go beyond um, where clinical theories have is really helpful, I think, for me in terms of being critical as well. Reading beyond what you hear in the normal theories can help you to be quite creative and, again, critical in different ways. I think that was probably something that was quite helpful in the interview as well. Next up, preparing for questions on professional issues, which I think overlaps with the previous two sections, clinical and research. I kind of split up this prep into three sections. So firstly, personal, like social graces, issues of power, supervision, my own personal values. I think that was super important to reflect on. Also working within a group and dealing with conflicts and working in a team and then service user involvement as well. Linking back to finding an interesting research paper, I thought about current issues in the field of clinical psychology, but again, who reads academic papers in their spare time? So I found the best way to keep up with current issues in clinical psychology with my attention span is through Twitter and finding one or two clinical psychologist accounts. And then through looking who they're following, you can find a bunch of clinical psychology Twitter accounts, psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists. When I was preparing last year, so the issues I thought about and read about were, were anti-racism, digital poverty, especially in COVID. And then last year, the text revision of the DSM-5 came out, so it introduced prolonged grief disorder. And then the interesting paper I found eventually was about maladaptive daydreaming. I was watching a YouTube video about it, literally just from personal interest. And off the back of that YouTube video, I just looked up maladaptive daydreaming in Google Scholar and then found a paper about it. And so I could be like, here's an interesting academic paper I've read recently in my extensive academic reading. Later on in the video, Sean talks about some very useful resources he found in preparing for his own interview. Some other areas you can prepare for in professional issues are legislation, 
what are the relevant acts to clinical practice. Roshin talked a bit about the Mental Health Act, for example, and then NHS specific issues. So you will be working in the NHS as a qualified clinical psychologist, unless you go private and chase the bag. But anyway, it's good to brush up or learn for the first time uh, some stuff about the NHS constitution, long-term plan, the five-year forward view, and values specific to the trust you would be working in. For example, here at Oxford, I looked at the values of Oxford Health NHS Trust. So my work experience prior to the doctorate wasn't in the NHS, it was in a private mm. practice. So I made sure to have conversations with colleagues and friends of mine who were in NHS roles so that I felt that I was more up to date or in the know about what's going on within the NHS, within mental health at the moment. I kind of spent some time looking into I guess, NHS, the code of conduct and mm. issues in NHS practice and familiarize myself a bit with that. Um, I did those fairly last minute and I think I was kind of going against my own advice there of trying not to learn new tricks. And I also did prepare a few answers of professional issues that I, might, I may have encountered, like disagreeing with a decision that was made by your supervisor. There are nine, I think it's nine, uh, nine core competencies of a clinical psychologist. So I had a look at those different values and um, tried to think about different ways that I might meet those and mm -hmm. Like each of them. Was that helpful in the end? Yeah, it was actually. One of the um, competencies was leadership. So clinical mm -hmm. psychologists are increasingly taking on a leadership role in the NHS and uh, thinking about the various leadership positions that I'd taken on um, and reflecting on those experiences, how I found that, what I did and didn't like about that and why and so on. Um, that was, I, I think, quite helpful in interviews. I read the long term plan. Like... Did you? He told you what's in it because I don't know. <laughs> Well, honestly, I can't remember a thing of it and it probably wasn't very helpful. I read the like reforming the mental health act paper. I had a lot of like criticisms of it, which I felt I could kind of talk about in an interview if I needed mm. to. I think I also like spent some time thinking about different services I've worked in and the differences between them. So like comparing NHS to research, to charities and thinking kind of more broadly about the system that I was working in and... Mm that are there. They're not listening out for like the exact keywords of the constitution. They're listening to see if you are compassionate through your examples. It's not about saying the words, it's about being them. If you have a clinical psychology interview, you probably know enough, likely more than enough to do well on the doctorate. But a completely separate skill is doing well at interviews. There can be loads of reasons why we don't bring across our best self under the spotlight of an interview, such as nerves and conciseness. So how did I manage this? For my own interviews. I remember the weekend before my interviews being absolutely terrified, like so anxious. You can easily come out of an interview and think, oh my god, like how did I not say that? And so there were a few things I did to try and make myself calmer in the actual moment, even though it is like, I need to charge this phone, even though it is just inherently anxiety provoking anyway. Firstly, mock interviews I always found useful for any interview, uh, to get used to being in a grilling situation, being under the spotlight, working with unexpected questions, which I have another tip for in the resources section of this video later on. Also record the interview and listen back to it, watch it back, just to see how you come across to somebody else. And then perhaps a more rogue tip is try public speaking. I think my attitude towards public speaking has changed a lot in the last few years. I tried a number of sessions of Toastmasters, which is an international public speaking club with clubs all over the world. They're in most UK cities. You can check on the website. They also do some entirely remotely because arguably remote public speaking is a completely different skill to in-person public speaking. You can pay to join the club or you can turn up as a guest for free for as many weeks as you want. I think I turned up to like seven sessions without paying a penny. And when you are a guest, you can give a speech in the section of the club called table topics. It's basically an improvisation section where you're given a random topic and immediately you have to go up to the front of the room and talk to everyone about it for two minutes. When I first heard of the concept of that, I was absolutely terrified and then and terrified when I actually came to do it for the first time. Amazingly, week by week, it actually got easier. Like just through that exposure, I think it gives you really transferable skills to interviews because the spotlight is entirely on you. You're not gonna get an interview panel of like 20 people, but also you have to wrap up your speech in a certain time, two minutes in this case. And when you forget what you're talking about in a table topic, you basically just lean on your bullshitting skills and cues like intonation and body language just to get you through it. And I think being able to lean on those bullshitting skills in an interview is always really helpful. And a final benefit of public speaking clubs is that you can watch experienced public speakers absolutely nail it and pick up things like how they structure speeches, 
how they use their body language. And on being time limited, I found it really useful to write down every question that the interviewers gave me as they were asking them. And I got this other piece of advice from an Oxford trainee, which was to ask the interviewers to repeat every single question. Both of those things account for potentially three minutes into an answer, realizing you've forgotten what you're talking about, which I've done so many times, but also asking them to repeat the question buys you a few more seconds to think about what you want to say. And you can even just pause at the start entirely, just take like that 10 seconds to think about what you're going to say, write down the structure of your answer, which is a technique most of the people in this video actually used. How did you cope with the pressure and the nerves of like doing the interview? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> like, roughly work to calm me down. And I was teaching anxiety management techniques at the time. That's the irony, isn't client. it? I tried all the usual stuff that we recommend to clients, like kind of rationalizing mm. anxiety and stuff. It helped a bit, I guess, but it just was an anxiety for every time. I just had to do what I could to cope. Yeah. And then on the morning of the interview, I called my friend who I've also worked with and I was like, I just need some compliments. Like I'm calling you blatantly compliment switching. Like tell me how great I am. Because I cannot tell you a single strength of mine right now. And so she listed some like really nice things about me. I wrote them down and had them had them on a post it on my interview yeah. just to like actually remember I can do some things and that people can see some strength in me even if I can't see them in that moment. I know for me, no matter what, I was gonna be nervous in the interview. And I spent quite a bit of time laying out the room, thinking about what the lighting was gonna look like, what I was gonna wear at the time. And those things aren't necessarily important to the interview and don't think about it too much. But I know for me that that stuff will be playing in the back of my mind if I didn't really focus on getting those things out of my head. I also practiced answers by myself with a timer. So if the interview is like 10 questions in an hour, for example, accounting for follow-up questions and then delivering the question to you, you probably have like four or five minutes to give your answer. And if you can practice giving answers in a four minute time frame, then I think that stands you in good stead for the actual interview. However, not everyone agrees with this philosophy, specifically Liam. Yeah, and I guess that kind of brings about another point, which is like conciseness. I don't know if you pre prepared in particular to answer in a way that didn't sort of waffle on. I did not prepare for that. And then re upon reflection, I probably should have because um, my interview went over the time limit by about 20 minutes. So I kind of view it as the interviewer's responsibility to keep time rather than it being mm. my responsibility. But of course you don't want to waffle so much and then miss the point. On one hand, you do want to be concise, but on the other hand, you want to kind of take up the space as much as possible that you're offered by the interviewers to like, you know, put across everything that you can. I don't know whether maybe the broader idea is that it's not talking for talking's sake. If you do go over, it's kind of Maybe you have a structure to your answer that you're following. And then at the end, I always found it useful to summarize what I said to them. I made a note of the questions or sort of keywords in the questions that would remind me of, of what they said. When they ask the question, take a beat to think about your answer. Because I, mm -hmm. I in interviews, the silences that you perceive are probably a lot longer than what they perceive it to be. I also took 15 seconds or so at the beginning of each question to jot down the points I wanted to make. It's very unnerving sitting there at the beginning and being silent for 10, 15 seconds whilst you do that. But in that way, you've kind of done the hardest part of the work in the first 15 seconds. After that, you're kind of running an autopilot a bit. Mm -hmm. just... Wrote down everything they said and like told them at the start so they wouldn't just have this awkward pause of me like looking down at your face. <laughs> It just was like, I've been writing, I hope that's okay. Just looking down before you start answering, like... <laughs> just having a bit <laughs> myself and then reappearing. Yeah. <laughs> remote interviewing. All our interviews last year were remote. So if you do have an upcoming remote interview, here is some advice specific to remote interviewing. Firstly, it can be good to have a mobile hotspot on standby in case your Wi-Fi drops out. And in fact, just kick everyone off the Wi-Fi, to be honest, before you're interviewed. Also, being interviewed remotely, less of your body language is visible. Make sure to be super expressive with your face and your kind of voice. Maybe you can sit a bit further back and just engage in that like power posing. But probably the most important advice for remote interviews is to try not to look like a serial killer. Try to look into the camera and make eye contact with it so it looks like you're giving eye contact to the interviews. Don't be one of those people who has the camera on their desk looking up while you're looking at a monitor because it looks like you're staring into outer space. Also have a good light source if you can. Be in front of a window if your interviews during the day especially or just have a lamp behind the camera or even like a sexy ring light. Look at this, look at that ring light. Look at the way it reflects off my skin, like fantastic. If your light source is behind you, it can create a lot of shadows and that's when you start to look like a serial killer. So don't do that. 
I found it quite helpful to practice answering interview questions with my laptop camera on, on my, of my face, because there's something quite odd about the first, when you're on a Zoom call and you see your own face moving and that kind of thing is quite weird. And if that kind of takes your attention away from answering the question, I wondered if that would, yeah, have a negative impact on the sort of quality of my answer. So I kind of practiced answering some questions with my camera on. In the interview, um, I was shitting myself. So I basically looked at my own face for the whole thing because I thought this is something familiar. This is something I've done before. So I barely looked at the interviewers. And that's one of the nice things about online interviews because it would be quite odd if you looked at your own face in a face-to-face interview, I think, um, mm. practically and, um, you know, for interview purposes. We found it quite containing to not have to go somewhere. And I found for my extra interview, I was allowed notes. Are you allowed notes? And they didn't say you weren't allowed them. So it was kind of assumed. Maybe, maybe I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I had like notes, for, even though I didn't look at it once, it was just the fact that it was there, like was quite reassuring. So I think having some kind of notes to just remind you of like key stuff that you want to include or key issues mm. online. I think it's just like being somewhere that you're comfortable, the usual kind of stuff of feeling like you're in a place that's quiet and happy and you're not going to be disturbed, that kind of thing. What about course specific tasks? When it came to the written task for Oxford. Did you sort of prepare for that at all? I reviewed formulations because I had I had the sense whatever clinical task they're going to throw at you, you're going to need formulation skills anyway. It's never a bad thing to prepare for being able to. Yeah. So I just did formulations, formulations, formulations. I, I had no idea what to expect. So it was kind of like thinking about basic formulation and what a clinical situation might have. Um, yeah. but it really, it's just really hard to prepare for, I think. I'm sorry, boss. I literally did nothing for that. For me, looking back it's kind of about trusting yourself that if you have been offered an interview you're probably good enough to do a course and it's just a case of like whittling numbers down because mm-hmm. of the amount of places that exist and so when it comes to additional tasks like you, you probably already have the competencies and it's mm-hmm. about trusting that you do if you have a clinical task for a particular course going in the clearinghouse website and looking at the court what the uh, p- web page says about the course probably tells you what you should focus on for the clinical task. So for Oxford, for example, it's very CBT heavy as a course. So having an awareness of CBT was helpful for that clinical task. I think that's that's an interesting question as well, because I think the course were intentionally really vague about what that task involved. And I think to a point just realized, okay, they've clearly done this on purpose because they're not expecting us to prepare and that's okay. So similar to the actual interview itself, I just tried to relax as much as I could and just think this is their way of trying to help us showcase the skills we've got rather than trying to throw us off. If they were trying to throw us off, then they maybe would have given us more information because they might have tried to give us something mm-hmm. How did you approach the group task at UCL? I think because I have quite a dominant personality. (laughs) I had to be very conscious of the fact to kind of take a step back and listen more, thinking about what would be required from a clinical psychologist in group or team settings, because that's, I I would imagine those are the kind of skills that they want to see us demonstrating in a group task. I just thought that, oh, it would be good to maybe try and get the conversation going in a sense that you would be able to hear from everyone. Like do step into that leadership role, but at the same time being a leader isn't being a dictator. Like it's about being yeah. hear from others and being very considerate about other people's opinions, but make but being, being firm with your own as well. Yeah, because you don't want to sort of say nothing at all, but you also don't want to sort of overimpose yourself onto the group either. So I think what's most important for you to, to do in the group task is to let yourself be yourself. What would be the three the three traits that describe you best? And just think of those three traits and then try to make sure that the things that you say in group tasks show evidence of those traits. Just remembering that I've not got much information on this, but neither is anyone else who's going through the application process as well. If you come away from it and you think, oh, that really went horrendously, there'll be people who are feeling exactly the same. And um, remembering that you don't have to be perfect to be a clinical psychologist and mm. they are expecting you to be perfect. And it's actually completely natural. And with Lester, they did like a situational judgment test. Oh yeah. I just came away from it and just thought, is that really measuring what a clinical psychologist is like? And mm. A lot of the situations they put forward, I thought, you're going to train us. If I got on this course, you're going to train us on that. And you're just going to teach us how to do that. So why are you asking me about this now? You're trying to just like always get stuff right. Whereas I think for a doctor, it should be more about who you are and your capacity to learn. Than yeah, definitely. You can't do anything with it. What were your three 
top traits? Wanted to come across as driven, kind. And the third one was compassionate. How did you bring those to the actual interview and like group tasks? Give me a sample question and I'll try to do it. How would you reduce DNAs did not attend uh, to service? Studies show that people who tend to disengage from therapy are, are those who don't have as high of a therapeutic alliance with their therapist as others. So I would really work on building that therapeutic alliance with my client, seeing what the barriers are that could come up for them. Like if it has issues to do with childcare or issues to do with not having access to a, pr a private space. I would work collaboratively with the client to try and problem solve this in order to reduce their DNA rate. We're all human at the end of the day. And the kindness bit comes when you, or the compassionate bit comes when you recognize that people do have other stressors in their life. And because they're not, not attending one or two sessions, because they have other responsibilities, it doesn't necessarily indicate that they're not ready for therapy. I think it's about seeing what the barriers are and how you can best address that like as a team. But there is a balance that you need to strike because at the end of the day, there are a lot of people on the wait list and a lot of other people need help that might be able to attend more consistently. What also helps might be to give them a phone call or drop them an email the day before to make sure that they are coming in um, because that kind of gives a little push. Like I am here, I'm looking forward to our session. Effort that you put into reaching out might make them feel more invested in therapy because they will mirror that they feel that you're invested in their therapy as well. That's such a good answer. It's very considerate of all different perspectives, the team and the client and yourself. I should have done a mock interview with you for the video. Ah. Finally, I did a role play for my Sheffield interview and I didn't get in, so take this with a pinch of salt, but I found it useful to practice the scenario with a friend beforehand. And it made me realize that given how time constrained that role play was, it was eight minutes. If I asked really open questions, I think I would have literally had about two sentences to say throughout the entire role play because, because the client naturally would talk about the difficulties for like five minutes at a time. And that's absolutely fine in a real session, but in the interview scenario, it really doesn't give you a chance to show what you can do other than nod. So I actually tried to think of more specific questions to ask in the real interview, rather than asking like, what's going on for you, super open. I asked, who do you feel you have around you to support you? Like who is in your corner? And that kind of constrained the role play a little bit in order that I could ask more questions. If you have multiple interviews, I learned from having my two that different interviewers do have really different styles. My experience of Oxford and everyone else I've talked to about the Oxford interview was that they tend to be really nice and encouraging of you to give your best answers. But I found that my Sheffield interview was very different. It's felt a lot more like blank faces and a more neutral stance, which I understand because it kind of makes it a level playing field if all the interviewers act in the same way towards the candidates. But obviously as a candidate, it's quite scary. So in terms of the interviewer's demeanor, I'd say prepare for the worst, but also hope for the best. Did the UCL interview differ quite significantly from the Oxford one? Yeah, format was was very different um mm. but the, the prep for both wasn't different like there's nothing that i could have done to prepare differently for one versus the other okay. like the interview you had to use different skills if that makes sense but that's something that will come to you in the moment i don't think that's something that you can prepare for i'd also be familiar with the general focus of the course like is it heavily cbt focused or does it have a more social political reflective nature to it because this might be reflected in the interview in terms of the types of questions you might get whether they're more personal than others some general advice about clinical psychology interviews how do you actually stand out because a lot you hear about the doctorate is that the competition is so high everyone's so good but there are so few places absolutely no idea yeah <laughs> since getting on i've looked at like my clearinghouse application and i've even thought about how i answered the questions and thought yeah i have no idea why i'm here you finish an interview you remember the things that didn't go well after my oxford interview uh and after i got in i had a follow-up call with one of my interviewers just to ask her questions about oxford and so on and i asked if there was any feedback about my interview it came across that i was really passionate about psych mm -hmm and that they could very clearly see that in the way that I was answering certain questions. I, I really enjoy talking about psychology and the, the fun facts about psychology and that type of stuff. Like even with my friends, I'm that person that brings that topic up when it, <laughs> not necessarily when I'm asked. One of the things which makes a difference for people is is really trying to take a really um, critical and reflective approach to psychology generally. Mm. So, um, psychology is a very new field, relatively speaking, and 
uh, nothing will be correct in it. All of our theories will be wrong, and all all of the conclusions drawn from studies will be wrong as well. Mm-hmm. Some conclusions are more wrong than others, and that's what you're looking for. Balance that critique with accepting that you have to make some decision. You can't say that everything is shit because you have to do something. What they said when they called me about the interview and they said I was warm, clear and calm. I think for me, I was just like, I felt much more comfortable to be myself. I think the panel really helped because they were just lovely, but I just felt able to kind of like make the odd joke or acknowledge my weaknesses and just just that kind of more comfortableness to show that I'm a human. And yeah. I think that really helped. I think compared to my first one where I was just really like, oh God, I have to prove myself. I think this one I was like, it's fine. Like I don't know everything and that's what they're expecting. I guess that kind of links to the advice that you don't have to be the finished article to get onto a course because the course actually trains you to be a clinical psychologist. And I think it's like knowing who you naturally are. So like not forcing yourself to be, to come across really like hearted or humorous if that's not something that's like comfortable. You don't have to be exactly what you think a good clinician is. It's just okay to be a bit more like who you are. If I had to hazard a guess for myself, I'd say for me, it might be that I brought my personality across. I talked about my own values and tried not to act in the way I think a clinical psychologist would act and just tried to be myself. I think if you can introduce something a bit different in your interview, whether that's a paper or a rogue theory or just like some great banter, just something that can help them to remember who you are. It's like applying to psychology stuff in general, like everyone is interested in mental health, but why are you different and unique? Cheeky resources. So what are some tangible, helpful resources I can hand to you on a plate right now? Firstly, social media, like I said before, there are plenty of Twitter accounts and YouTube channels that I used in my preparation. So I was binge watching Miranda's channel, The Worry People, Sharon V, Holly's channel, Clinical Psychology Community UK, Melody Smith, David Murphy, the list goes on. There's loads of channels out there. And then you can give yourself a mock interview. So there's a website called, let me just, Let me just share my screen one second. If we go on the website, clinside.org.uk, great resource, but absolutely terrible graphic design. You can tell it's been designed by a psychologist. There is a gigantic list of interview questions from 2007, uh, which I think loads of people have added to. So it's questions relevant to clinical psychology interviews, support worker interviews, assistant psychologist interviews. There's a shit ton of questions here. So what I did was copied and pasted that into um, random, random selector like that. Pick a random item from a list. Yes. So I pasted that in. Okay, ignoring the fact there is colon, arrow, colon after each question. Basically, I put all these questions into a generator. Questions and a stopwatch and then I'd select pick a random item. Oh, it's got a spinning wheel. This is dramatic. What did you find interesting in your... Okay, that's a bit of a shit question. I don't want a survey. Oh, okay. So name one reference or recent book that had assisted you with your clinical work and explain why. I think this is a lot better than just reading questions and answering them. Like it's presented to you randomly. So I'd get the question up, start the timer, talk for four minutes. I read this book. Let's see. Oh, ACT made simple. What a book. So yeah, just a nice way on your own. Doesn't require you to have friends, which is great for me. So great way to just give yourself a mock interview. You can just pick 10 random questions. It might be a bit OTT, this kind of preparation. That's not the right keyboard for my computer. Oh, oh my God. It's so close. Someone died me. We're good. I guess my biggest course when it came to preparing was the support system both professional and personal that I built because I talked yeah. about it and colleagues and peers a lot something about that made you feel supported and like eased your anxiety even independent of whether they gave you any useful advice almost the sense that like I'm in this with you I asked my team to do a mock interview with me which I think was probably one of the best things I did. I found it really quite horrible, um, to be honest, at the time, because the team were like, okay, we're going to do a mock interview for you, Sean. We're gonna, you've got one chance. You've only got one interview. Is it this time? We're not going to do any more than that. And we're just going to give you really strict feedback on it. Like they were they were quite mm-hmm. brutal. And initially I thought, that doesn't seem that supportive. It feels like they're kind of not trying to be that <laughs> close to me. And then they're like, yeah, no, we did that on purpose because you, you only get one interview. You aren't going to be able to prepare with the people who are interviewing you ahead of time. So we tried to replicate that as much as we can so many mock so much prep i got so sick of my own voice that it was helpful yeah Think back to it and thinking like that made no sense that kind of thing i think it can be helpful to look up sample interview questions and things like that online but try not to get too hung up on those things because whatever happens in an interview you simply aren't going to be asked to set up stop questions when i was preparing for the interview uh, particularly when i found out it was for oxford i looked a lot into whether any trainees from oxford had posted any stuff online uh, one thing i found really helpful was listening to psychology-based podcasts Eww. 
podcasts are a really good source of information where you've got people being asked questions, difficult clinical questions and research questions, and they're on the spot responding. The types of people that they get on popular podcasts, they're able to answer those questions really well. And you can learn the way that those people actually structure their answers. And also in a way to actually kind of ease my nerves a bit, I half pretended that during my interview, I was actually like a guest on a podcast. No. Nice. <laughs> Created that environment where it felt like I was in a position where they actually wanted to hear my answer. Which podcasts did you listen to then? I really like the psychiatry and psychotherapy podcast, therapist on censored podcast. I hear a lot of good stuff about the forensic psychology podcast, but I've not watched that one. There, there are a lot out there that are tailored to your interests. There's one I'm listening to at the minute called The Systemic Way. Uh, we're doing, as part of the, the um, Oxford course, we do a foundation in systemic practice, and I found that listening to a podcast on that was actually really handy. Mm. And I think the people that they have on that podcast actually people we've been taught by to answer so don't just, i'm going to probably recommend it i oh, really i need to listen to these when i watch tv shows i start sort of taking on the mannerisms of the characters that i like for a temporary period so i like this idea of listening to podcasts i was watching a youtube channel called healthy gamer and i noticed in the interview i was sort of taking on his really assertive way of speaking and also stealing his points. I've given you a lot of advice today, but there's one part of the interview which stands head and shoulders above the rest and is ultimately the key to you getting on a clinical psychology training course. And that's what you wear. This is the outfit that brought it home. Black turtleneck from Boohoo. As you can see, very professional. As a psychologist, does it get better than a turtleneck? No. Just all those connotations, really powerful. And I think it's interesting that the other trainees thought about this quite a lot as well. So this is what they wore. What what did you wear to the interviews in the end? Nothing. I have this dress that's NHS blue. He's a lucky <laughs> It's like my lucky dress that I wear. Well, it's not lucky because I didn't get into Exeter, but for the women all messaging is key. Yeah. White top. I think it was from Zara. Lace almost with like these puffy sleeves there. And it made me feel very kind of feminine, but empowered, but professional but pretty a lot of the advice out there isn't really for guys because i guess of the demographic of people who get onto clinical psychology training courses so i felt a little bit on my own for that and i was thinking a three-piece suit is probably too much and then just a t-shirt probably isn't enough and i think to be honest you should probably just wear what a trainee clinical psychologist would wear or what you probably wear if you got on the course do everything that you can to be kind to yourself don't wear something itchy or uncomfortable i think you're absolutely right like I wore a turtleneck and I was like, this is, this is what psychologists wear. Like, I'm just like them. I just wore a shirt and I had a jumper on standby in case it got too cold. But that's the thing. When the nerves kicked in, you do not think about that at all. Where along the spectrum of smart to, to casual, would you say? Somewhere in the middle. I I feel... Somewhere in the middle. Yeah, if I'm too casual, I'm like, I don't feel prepared. But mm. if I'm formal, I just feel very, like, uptight. What colour was the shirt then? It's a lot of different connotations okay. with different colours blue shirt because I thought like, I'm wearing a white shirt it might draw too much attention to it does that look too much and you know yeah. I was really thinking about all this stuff some pieces of advice for interviews that I saw at the time that were about where's something that expresses you and something that really represents who you are and I think that can be really good advice I know for me it was just about not trying to make that stand out as much because I didn't want to draw attention away from it find a few bullet points of advice just to round things off don't forget to put your own personality across and smile you know in all this preparation we can get lost in thinking about have we memorized all the facts to recall an interview. But remember, in the interview, you are a human being with a personality and a smile, hopefully. So make sure you show that. If you can, it can be useful to find a trainee to give you a mock interview. Get feedback from the interviewers, regardless of whether you're successful. I think there's always something you can improve on. And finally, if you do have an interview, you deserve to be there. Act like you deserve to be there as well. Miranda from The Worry People has this great piece of advice from her own video about interviews, which is that when you get into the interview room and they ask how you're doing, less of this, I'm a bit nervous, like a bit shaky, but okay. Less of that, more, I'm happy to be here. I am Francis, really excited to be here. I like it, yeah. Reste lucide là-dedans. Fucking stay focused in here. Here's everyone else's final advice. And again, if you do have an interview coming up, congratulations and best of luck. C'est trois points dimanche aussi, hein. Fucking three points on Sunday as well. I think practicing and in mock interviews and recording them, maybe I didn't do that myself, but maybe recording them and thinking, like a little behavioral experiment thinking that, oh, if I'm quiet for three seconds, it actually doesn't sound that long. Having that critical reflectiveness over everything you do, whether it's designing a study, whether it's critiquing a study, whether it's um, working in a therapy room or thinking about the various professional practice values that clinical psychologists have. I think if you take that approach to everything, 
uh, that probably um, I imagine is what makes the difference. Relax, be yourself. If you get rejected, it's not you they're rejecting, it's your application and that's okay. Mm -hmm. The application isn't who you are. It's really important to know yourself and know what you're going to be like on the day. How do you respond to an interview? Mm. And preparing yourself for that, making sure you're covering all your bases and making sure you feel like you can answer a question, make yourself as comfortable as possible. It's important to consider what you're going to do after the interview. And I had some plans to see my friends that evening, you know, just do something else, which switch me off from the interview entirely. Mm. If you spend a lot of time after your interview just thinking about how you answered and you know you're not going to be able to say everything you want to put forward in the interview and you're not going to get the perfect questions. The more you think about it, the kind of worse it's going to get. So be kind to yourself and do something nice for yourself after your interview. Do you have any final words of advice for anyone who's got an interview? I would take comfort in the fact that if, if Francis can get on the course and pass the interview, then probably anyone can. 